Sometimes the best way to defeat evil is to laugh in its face. <laughs> Stop laughing at me! Tyrannical wankers hate that. And this is partly why Stephen King's The Stand stuck with me when I read it 30 years ago and still holds up reading it again today. And also why, despite the author's very vocal, but at this point essentially establishment left politics, I continue to think of The Stand as an anti-authoritarian text, whether it's the US military industrial complex accidentally killing everyone with a bioweapon, the Free Zone Committee rigging their own election and drafting people for a near suicidal mission, or Randall Flagg's brutish kingdom in Vegas. It's an examination of the nature of power structures. And it resonates across generations. Maybe because it echoes a deep cultural memory in the Western world of the Black Death. Or maybe, for whatever reason, we're just drawn to stories about the destruction of our own society. Whatever the case, it has that core element of good mythology. It transcends its time. It gets retold, which always leads to a reimagining, sometimes a mangling, but in the end a refining of the core ideas. The story of a near-extinction-level plague and the demonic shenanigans that follow, the book was originally published in 1978, re-released in an expanded and updated version in 1990, and adapted to television twice. The story begins with an excitable E-4 on guard duty at a government-run bioweapons lab. We have never never engaged in the clandestine manufacture of substances outlawed by the Geneva Conventions. Every government condemns them, but they all seem to have at least one. The inevitable containment breach unleashes a superflu with a 99.4% fatality rate and an irritating habit of constantly mutating to get around any immune response. Just exposed specialist Campion here understandably flips out, then grabs his family and drives halfway across the country while the walking dude waits for the apocalypse to get ripe as the engineered flu-based bioweapon wipes out most of the human population. We follow several survivors from around the country as dreams compel them to converge into new tribes, one collecting around an old black woman called Mother Abigail who believes she's acting as a mouthpiece for God. The other in Las Vegas, under the leadership of a man, an entity really, calling himself Randall Flagg. Which works in terms of North America, but I always wonder what's going on in the rest of the world. I sometimes want to write these stories about a guy in England having the dreams, and he spends weeks studying nautical maps and gathering supplies into a boat to sail to America, and then suddenly the dreams just stop. Or one about a little kid in Shanghai having fun driving a truck around the city and letting the pandas out of the zoo. The stand begins with an apocalyptic tale, the mass die-off from the flu and the immediate aftermath of people trying to survive and come to grips with their new world. On a scale of apocalyptic scenarios, it's actually one of the milder ones, if you survive the flu, of course. I say this because some of the most pressing problems of a civilizational collapse aren't an issue in this case. You won't starve, there's packaged food all over the place and it'll keep for years, and the risk of bandits coming after you for supplies are quite low because the only thing there's a scarcity of is HSAPs. Everyone's gone and everything still works, as opposed to, for example, the change in S.M. Sterling's Emberverse series where nothing works but everyone is still there, which I think is the more horrifying situation to contemplate. In 1994, The Stand was adapted into a TV miniseries from a screenplay written by Stephen King, which makes it particularly interesting for cross-medium comparisons, and again as a one-season series in 2020, which turned out to be supremely awkward timing and pushed most of the series into 2021 due to government hysteria over a decidedly non-apocalyptic leak at a biolab. I'll compare those adaptations a bit later, but first let's look at the overall story arc. The basic conflict is on the level of freedom versus tyranny, justice versus oppression, with the survivors neatly split into two factions. The good guys coalesce around Mother Abigail in Boulder, Colorado, but they govern the community, the Boulder Free Zone, through a committee. It's given the trappings of a representative body, but for valid and well-established reasons, it's unabashedly a sham. And we'll see to it that the people who get elected are the same people who are on the ad hoc committee. We'll put the rush on everybody and get the vote taken before people can do any tub thumping for their friends. We can handpick people to nominate us and then second us. The vote will go through as slick as shit through a goose. That's neat, Stu said admiringly. Sure, Glenn said glumly. If you want to short circuit the democratic process, ask a sociologist. 
On the other side is Randall Flagg, a demonic being setting up a dictatorship in Las Vegas. He's the center of life there. He draws power from the belief of his followers, and that's all they are to him, a source of power. Tools and psychic batteries. He can be thought of as a personification of centralizing power structures. He's the corrupt state incarnate, unforgiving, overbearing, and demanding obedience. His name is Flag, kind of on the nose. He draws to him those who seek power themselves, those who are driven by fear, and those who are just easily manipulated. He's a reminder not so much that power corrupts, but that power attracts the corrupt. Flag serves as a warning against fear, against giving in to our worst impulses and letting corrupt leaders with simple answers lead us into ruin. At this point, King might launch into a Trump rant. I apply it much more broadly. And while Flag is a literal demon, a malicious being with supernatural powers, the real monsters of the story are groups of people. The military-industrial complex that created the superflu, and later the people gathered in Vegas who follow Flag as their savior. He approaches the desperate and the weak-willed, most notably Lloyd Henry, whom he rescues from starvation in a jail cell, and the trash can man, a pyromaniac and idiot savant when it comes to machinery. While Lloyd is a loyal minion to the end, even when he starts to have doubts, Trash Can Man can't help himself and causes a great deal of damage to Flag's plans by rigging explosives to several helicopters and fuel trucks to watch them burn. I couldn't help it! I couldn't help it! I'm so sorry! Notably, though, it isn't all nutters and criminals that go to Flag. He appears to get a disproportionate percentage of the surviving military and police. I spent 22 years on the Santa Monica PD, and I know what happens when guys like you end up running the show. We haven't got a single addict in Vegas. Can your people say the same? The book has a few other incidents and lines that suggest this less bluntly. For example, the four thugs that set up an ambush to expand their harem and include deserting soldiers heading west. In contrast to the notable lack of police and military in the Boulder Free Zone, is it fair to say that most cops and soldiers will obey monsters? I don't know. But historically, a whole lot will. More interesting to me is this line. I think he's going to get most of the techies, Glenn said finally. Don't ask me why, it's just a hunch. Except that tech people like to work in an atmosphere of tight discipline and linear goals for the most part. They like it when the trains run on time. That's Glenn Bateman, the somewhat crotchety old sociology professor and probably my favorite character in this story, despite myself having been a techie that actually likes some chaos in the workflow. Glenn's always thinking in terms of long-term implications on society. He's the analytical voice while everyone else is running around trying to get the lights back on and all the carcasses buried. We say fine, you're fine mother, God's fine too. And then we go right back to tinkering with the power station, trying to recreate the world that damn near choked the human race to death. What's wrong with this picture? But aside from being obnoxiously analytical in the face of catastrophe, another reason I like this character comes down to when he meets Flag face to face. He's locked in a cell, essentially powerless, and Flag is bearing down with the weight of the circumstances and his own intimidating presence. Glenn does the one thing that people in positions of power can't stand. He doesn't take him seriously. It's just that, it's just that we made such, such a business of you, and it turns out you're nothing more than another cockroach scurrying around, running little roach errands. When you obey, you validate their power. Even if you fight them, you're acknowledging that they have some control, that they're the one with real agency, and you're just reacting to them. But to laugh in their face, to expose the farce, it's devastating. The foundation of Flag's power, the thing that gives him a mandate with the people that follow him, is his apparent omniscience, his ability to supernaturally see across great distances, to foresee the future, and the certainty that he's going to win and that they better be in his good graces. He has to be infallible. And as soon as he's not, it all starts crumbling. Lloyd was shaking his head. I don't understand it at all. Everything was going so good, right up to the night he came and said the old lady was dead over there in the free zone. He said that the last obstacle was out of our way, but that's when things started to get funny. 
the people start to lose faith. They start slipping away. Me and some of the others are cutting loose. Man, I must be crazy telling you this. It's all right. Cut loose where? South America, near Rio. And even Flag begins to doubt. His thoughts chased each other like weasels in the dark. Things were getting just a trifle flaky around the edges. He didn't like it. By the time he's captured the men sent as sacrificial lambs on a pilgrimage to Vegas to stand against him, he's firmly in the panic state of a collapsing power structure. We can see it happening in the world today. The people no longer trust him and increasingly don't even believe in his power. So where he once could rely on promises and an air of legitimacy, he now must rely on brute force, displays of power. He takes the two men and puts them on a stage. He gathers the entire population of the city to watch as he enumerates their crimes, including fabrications to cover up his own mistakes. Know you that the cohorts of these men were responsible for the sabotage bombing of the helicopters at Indian Springs, and therefore responsible for the deaths of Carl Ho, Bill Jameson, and Cliff Benson. They are guilty of murder. Larry's eyes touch those of a man standing on the front rim of the crowd. Although Larry did not know it, this was Stan Bailey, operations chief at Indian Springs. He saw a haze of bewilderment and surprise cover the man's face, and saw him mouthing something ridiculous that looked like Can Man. What Flagg had intended as a show of strength only spotlights his weakness. Those in the know see the lie and wonder what else they've been lied to about. Even the now irradiated and blinded trash can man senses it when he returns with a nuclear warhead in tow as an offering of atonement. Flag, the dark man, has lost his mystique and with it his power. Not because an army defeated him, but because people looked into his face and said no. No. Because people he was trying to intimidate simply laughed at him. His only real power was his ability to make others act and once the awe turns into contempt, He's nothing. I'll tell you what you do. Why don't you find a nice big sand pile, get yourself a hammer, and pound all that sand right up your ass. But that's an anticlimactic ending. Crowd laughs, flag hangs his head and runs away, the end. But maybe it should have been left at that. Stephen King is a very good writer in many ways, but writing satisfying endings isn't one of them. Sorry. Do you see it? The hand of God. Yeah, that's directly out of the book. I don't know how it really happened, but I always have this image of King sitting there at his typewriter, big manuscript stacked up next to him, not quite sure how he wants to wrap up all the story threads. Meanwhile, his publisher keeps calling him two or three times a day. Hey Steve, is the book done? We're all waiting on you. Running late, Steve. When's the book gonna be done? And then he just snaps. Screw it. The hand of God comes down from the sky, grabs the nuke, boom. Here's your book. Give me my money. But my dislike of that ending isn't just because of the cheese factor amplified by mid-90s video toaster CGI. It also flies in the face of everything suggested in the rest of the book. After the shortcomings and machinations of every authority in the story from the U.S. government to flag to the Free Zone Committee, the conflict is resolved with the ultimate authority stepping in. Even with the God's will aspect through Mother Abigail, it's always a choice. Each character has to decide which way to go, decide whether to heed God's word when it's been revealed to them. Until the hand of the Almighty literally drops down from the sky and smites Sin City. It's a bizarre turn. But in the end, after all the death and a little divine intervention, the survivors in Colorado are building a pocket republic, starting back down the same road that got them there. But it's an open question whether it has to go that way. In this story, the Dark Lord has been defeated and banished, but there's no king to restore to the throne. Just people who've had their illusions of stability and social order yanked out from under them. Some are content to copy the old ways, but others choose to leave, to wander out into the empty continent around them and live their own way. He looked east and discovered he could at last name something he had felt stirring around in himself since the snow had begun to melt an urge to move on. There were too many people here. They weren't exactly stepping all over each other, at least not yet. 
but they were beginning to make him feel nervous. In contrast with Flag, reconstructed and somewhat hazy of mind amidst a primitive tribe somewhere in the tropics. They began to drop on their knees and bow their heads before him, and as his dark, dark shadow fell among them, his grin widened. I've come to teach you how to be civilized. To me, these two ending threads ask us to consider what the function of government, of civilization, really is. Are they to remain tools to serve the good of the people, or will they be allowed to again become ends unto themselves, forcing the people to serve them? The entire story suggests that the plague wasn't just a global catastrophe and a near extinction event, but also an opportunity to start over free from past mistakes. Maybe it's a one-time chance to really think about the world we're building. It wouldn't be such a bad thing, Stu thought, watching Franny pump water, if the free zone did fall apart. Glenn Bateman would think so, he was quite sure. Its purpose has been served, Glenn would say. Best to disband before... Before what? In addition to the 78 and 90 versions of the book, many others know The Stand only through the 1994 miniseries and the 2020 series, both of which have some significant deviations from the book. The 94 series arguably makes more substantive changes, but in making those changes it stays truer to the essence of the story. There are several iconic scenes in the book. For example, Larry Underwood is a newly minted rock star with a hit single when the plague starts its work. His song is the last one stuck in everyone's head when the airwaves go silent. He won the pop star game. Larry is trying to get out of Manhattan by walking through the corpse-filled Lincoln Tunnel, and the scene is a superb piece of suspense writing. Nothing much happens, the corpses don't turn zombie or anything, but it feels like they're going to at any moment while Larry fumbles around with only a lighter to illuminate his path, walking through a concrete tube full of rotting meat and scorching summer heat while lugging a pack, every sound amplified and echoing from all directions. Take a moment to mentally put yourself in that situation. Blind, disoriented, surrounded by bloated plague carcasses, accompanied only by the voices in your own head. The 94 version does it straight, though the need to actually see something on screen diminishes it some. The 2020 version tried to add more action. There was a gang of stockbrokers gone wild in pursuit, and the pitch-black death tunnel was replaced with a sewer that had plenty of light coming in. Sure, there was more action, but it was kind of boring. It lacked the suspense. This version overall isn't bad, but it suffers from this kind of thing throughout, slavishly adhering to the book when it probably shouldn't, while changing or adding things that are often inferior to the source material. The 2020 series is actually truer to the book in many ways, for example with Larry meeting Rita Blakemore, the widow of a wealthy New York businessman. She's completely out of her element, a bit high-strung, often a pain in the ass, definitely not the first pick when you're choosing your zombie team. She tries, they travel together, but she pops too many pills and eventually dies. The book is full of bit-part characters like this who have their moment and then are gone, but who contribute to the wider story in small ways. While her role is small, her impact on Larry is significant. Her death haunts him throughout the story as this nagging doubt in the back of his mind. He's always worrying that he'll let everyone down just like he failed her. It works very well in the book. Less so on screen, where introducing a character, developing them in their relationship only to have them die shortly after muddles the story a bit. You can do it in a brick-sized novel, but film and television have to be a bit tighter in their storytelling. The 94 version accomplishes a lot by swapping Nadine Cross into Rita's scenes. Nadine is integral to the wider story, and this change allows all of Larry's setup to remain while also establishing Nadine early, bringing in the key elements of her background from the book without having to take a long digression in a teleplay that is already heavy on characters. A lot of fans at the time hated this change, but I think it's a textbook example of how to adapt a long, sprawling book into the much tighter confines of the screen, and it illustrates King's skill at telling a story. The core thread of Nadine's story is that she somehow promised to Randall Flagg. Why me? Who promised? Doesn't matter. And it's been the guiding element of her adult life. That destiny drives her decisions, drives her to do some despicable things that she doesn't even want to do, but she feels like she has no choice. Eventually, she realizes the full horror of what she's allowed herself to become part of, but 
it's much too late to say no, dear. Nadine's arc is one of the more significant because she knows she's on a course for a bad end, but she goes out of her way to stay on it out of a bizarre sense of inevitability. While the timing is reworked in the 94 series, she does travel with Larry for a while, and there's this kind of budding romance that she always shuts down because she's always known that she's meant for flag. It's the whole virgin sacrifice thing, need a clean vessel for the demonic seed. She doesn't want it, but the expectation has been placed on her. She lets herself be trapped by someone else's plan for her life, and when she decides she wants to escape that path, she latches on to the one option that she waited too long for. I want to stay here, Larry. Make love to me, and I can stay here. Which is interesting, because it implies that Larry would have been serving the greater good if he'd gone with her, ditching the woman he'd committed to. It would have blown up a central aspect of Flagg's plan if Larry hadn't grown into a responsible man that actually cares about other people. Taking the immediate carnal gratification route would have been the right thing for everyone except poor Julie sitting at home. Don't you understand? It's too late. His refusal pushes Nadine, and by extension Harold Lauder, further into Flagg's influence and facilitates the death of several people. Larry even reflects on this later. But at the same time, it doesn't matter, because in a fit of rage, Flagg throws Nadine out of a high-rise window. That's one of the changes King made for the TV adaptation that I think is a clear improvement. In that version, she takes the initiative to kill herself and the demon baby she's carrying. It's a better redemption arc, such as it is. As opposed to Harold Lauder, he begins as a creepy kid. He's always cast very different from how he's described in the book, but the essence is definitely there. He's bitter, partly because people do treat him like a nuisance, but partly because he can't let a grudge go, and he tends to confuse how he wishes things were with how they actually are. It pushes him toward Flag, and he ends up killing several people with a bomb before fleeing for Vegas. And just like Nadine, he hesitates before plunging over the edge. Maybe I don't want to anymore, Harold whispered. He was still looking at her hair. She put his hand on it. Too late, Harold, she said. But unlike her, Harold stays committed to the course until Flagg discards him, leaving him to die in a ditch. Then, and only then, does he scrawl out a confession, an apology, a plea for forgiveness. It's not the only time in the book that someone is perfectly happy to do terrible things right up until they're bleeding out, then all of a sudden they're sorry. Too late, Harold. Now let's consider Stu Redman, a favorite of many readers and a case study in adapting a character to the screen. Played by Gary Sinise in 94 and James Marsden in 20, he's among the first to be exposed to the flu when specialist apeshit here crashes into the pumps at Stu's buddy's gas station. Pretty soon the feds are putting the little Texas town under quarantine, and Stu, being the only one not showing any symptoms, is taken to a lab in Vermont to be studied in the hope a cure can be derived from his blood. Having Joe Bob Briggs play Deputy Joe Bob was a nice touch, too. Eventually, everyone dies, and Stu has to get out of the building, again full of dead bodies. He's right on the edge of losing it. Come down and eat chicken with me, beautiful. It's so dark. That's a creepy dude. Like Larry in New York, Stu has to get his fear under control, assess the situation, and find a way through. Follow the light, Mr. Redmond. Except in the 20 cut, where General Starkey shows him the way out. It was a well-acted scene with decent dialogue, but it was a bad story move. All through the stand, with that one glaring exception at the end, all the characters are acting as autonomous beings. Even the major characters that give themselves over to Flag do it as a conscious choice. Lloyd in his cell doesn't just reflexively take Flag's offer to open the door, he stops to consider it. He knows that if he accepts it, he's committing himself to Flagg's cause. The same with the trash can man. There's a moment of consideration deliberately included in the text, drawing attention to the moment when the individual surrenders their autonomy to another. In that vein, Stu escaping from the hospital isn't just about getting out of the building. It's about escaping from systems of control, of reclaiming his autonomy after being captured and confined, powerless and at the mercy of others. 
in the remake, that's taken away. He doesn't find his way out. The general, an authority figure, tells him where to go. Instead of breaking free from a failed authority, he's made to depend on it, and consequently the entire sequence is gutted of impact. A similar thing happens with Glenn, where his face-to-face -face rebuff of Flag in the book in the 94 production is replaced with a gaudy show trial in the 2020 remake. Flag isn't even there. Glenn gives a good speech, but the scene doesn't have the impact of just showing us Flag's uneasy scowl while he's being laughed at. Like a lot of the plot lines foisted on the world in 2020, it just doesn't work. Perhaps the most jarring change made in the 2020 series was to drop the linear continuity, instead opting to start around the midpoint and bounce back and forth through time. It worked well to condense Harold Lauder's character setup into a single episode, and he is important to the story, no doubt, but it's not as though something was lacking in the original linear storytelling. What it did do, however, was completely destroy the sense of dread that came with watching society unravel as the death toll rises. Many of these changes, whether transforming the face-to-face -face confrontation between Glenn and Flagg in the jail into a mass spectacle show trial, or the foot chase through Manhattan, added action and scale at the expense of character and impact. Even the attempt to rework the ending to something that would look less ridiculous on the screen than the literal hand of God falls a bit flat, though it's certainly visually interesting. I rewatch the 94 miniseries every 10 years or so, despite how dated it is. I doubt that the remake will be remembered as fondly when 2030 rolls around. I'm sure some folks are annoyed that I didn't even mention Nick Andros or Tom Cullen, which in a review video would be unconscionable. But I'm far more interested in talking about ideas than people. M-O-O-N. That spells misanthropy.